Okay, so, y'all know me, Ed Friedman, Chair of the Marine today. Um, you know that Patagonia supports this uh, speaker series, present, uh, speaker series event has for many years, and they, um, they are generous enough to uh, donate some product here uh, for incentive for a door prize. Uh, it costs us well over $1,000 a year to put the series on, so <laughs> y'all know what we do. Um, so we've got some stuff up here and, and photographic books here. Research, advocacy, uh, conservation, and education are our primary areas uh, where we work. And, uh, you know, protecting well over 1,000 acres of land around the bay. There are some new faces here since last time. I will say that we are in the process of... Um, waiting for a closing date to protect the most significant and largest unprotected parcel on the bay, Center's Point, right, which is a really great spot, 100, about 128 acres in the island. And uh, uh, we're actively doing work with the schools outside and inside. Um, uh, and in terms of advocacy these days, working on National Environmental Policy Act issues, and really trying to get the lights turned off at the chops. The towers, new towers there are lit up to destroy the night sky in the bay. Three layers of flashing red lights at night. And as an alternative, what CMP is trying to do is put radar on there, to broadcast EMFs over every place, that would tell when an airplane is in the area and only turn the lights on then. And as many of you know, we've been one of the few environmental groups concerned about the proliferation of wireless radio frequency radiation, and there's certainly no need to be subjecting everybody 24-7 to 9.5 gigahertz X-band radar when there's no airplanes anyway, you know? So we're working on that. Uh, and CMP gets paid for based on what they spend. So this is like a half a million dollar project to put radar in. They get like 10 to 14 percent back via rate hikes for return on equity. So this is really crazy. So if any of you happen to know David Flanagan, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. I'd love to, so I'd like to go meet him and say this would be a really easy win for CMP right now, which they, they could use. Just turn the light switch off, you know. I know where he lives. Cool. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, our, our next speaker uh, will be, should be interesting. Uh, most of you know that Maine Yankee's been gone for a while, but Seabrook is the closest thing to a plant to here. Um, in New Hampshire, and uh, um, uh, Doug Bogan, who's the head of the, uh, the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League, will be up here second Wednesday in April, and he's been working on anti-nuke issues down there, working a lot on offshore wind farm issues, which he likes um, as a realistic alternative to nuclear power. But one thing that's happening at Seabrook, and probably is happening in other areas, and I forget the the acronym of the chemical name for it, but there's a chemical in the concrete that is really causing deterioration of the foundations. And it's huge, and a lot of people don't know about that. So he'll be here in April and talking about that. And, uh, you know, we are downstream, downwind, right? So, so uh, Mary here is a, uh, she's a native fish conservation biologist with the Maine Department of Animal Fisheries and Wildlife. She's been working there for 20 years as a stream ecologist. Um, works with stream survey methodologies, native fish ecology, uh, landscape, geographic information systems, data analysis, and uh, currently overseeing a statewide effort to survey and assess stream habitats, uh, document wild brook trout populations, enhance aquatic condition, aquatic habitat conditions, and improve general knowledge regarding distribution and status of Maine's native fishes, or our native fishes. Um, she's got a lot of wide-ranging interests as well in natural history and animal behavior, science, education, and so forth. And um, again, doing a lot more database work now, uh, monitoring state uh, threatened and endangered species for, for fish uh, for IFNW. And I think you told me over dinner you're the only fisheries biologist up in that area anyway. For, in Bangor. In Bangor, in the Bangor office. Yep. So, um, <laughs> and Mary's uh, Maine's representative of Eastern Brook Trout uh, Joint Venture and one of the department's representatives to the Northeast Fish and Wildlife Diversity Technical Committee. She's got a BA in Biology from SUNY over in Albany, the University of New York, and an MS in Zoology from the University of Maine. And I really appreciate you coming.
coming down from Bangor for this huge crowd gathered <laughs> to learn about this little fish. They're beautiful. So they're beautiful little fish. And Mary Meeting Bay is one of the only places in the state where they still are. Yes, still are. So. Thanks for the invite to come down and to talk about uh, a species of fish that is actually very near and dear to my heart because this is my master's work. A lot of it is. And I, but I have continued to work with this species because, lo and behold, it does occur in Maine. And it is uh, an endangered species. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we move on. But just to, to show you, these are bona fide redfin pickerel from the Mary Meeting Bay area, right around here in a couple of streams where we know that they occur. And these photos, this one was taken while I was doing my master's work in the mid-1990s, that long ago now, over 20 years. Um, but this one was much more recent in around 2010 uh, when I found a new population in this area. Um, so, and thanks for the, uh, the introduction there, Ed, and, and, and I am the Native Fish Conservation Biologist for IFNW. I have been in this role for over 18 years now with the state and with IFNW. Um, and I do a variety of things that Ed gave you a synopsis of. But one of the things that is near and dear to my heart are rare, threatened, and endangered species, and obviously fishes. I work with um, fish exclusively for IFNW, although I do collaborate with some of our wild, wildlife biologists on some habitat, aquatic habitat related issues, because habitat, 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 man, it's all about habitat. Um, but just a note about imperilment in the conservation of rare fishes. Not all rare fishes are imperiled, but you know what? A lot of them are. And what we mean by imperilment is that a species that occurs at a naturally low level of rate, but low level rate population wise, spotty distribution, but also is experiencing declines or, or in, uh, uh, subject to threats usually brought about by what we as humans are doing on our landscape. And I know that over the past couple years there have been a lot of high profile reports and efforts, scientific efforts recently published about the alarming declines across large wide ranging taxa groups like insects, butterflies, Audubon Society came out last year with a huge report about the decline of birds worldwide. Well, I'm here to tell you it's happening in fish as well. And the American Fisheries Society published a report about every 10 or 12 years they come out with a new update on the status of imperiled North American freshwater and diadromous fishes. They're about, <clears throat> about to come out with the, the most current report, the one that's readily available now, was published in 2008. And a major finding was approximately 39% of described fish species of North America, this is just North America, are truly imperiled. And the, the rates of imperilment increase the further north in latitude you go, and of course in areas of the continent that are experiencing more development and issues associated with what we as humans do on our landscapes. And that affects us here in Maine as well. So how do we protect imperiled fishes? Well there's two major tools available to us here in Maine. They're both law in, in law and of course most of us are familiar with the US Endangered Species Act. Redfin pickerel are not listed under the federal U.S. Endangered Species Act. Where we have them here in Maine, it's the northern extent of their natural distribution, but you go south where they occur, they're actually prevalent and more common. They're not to the point of being uh, kind of flagged or considered under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. The U.S. Endangered Species Act is an incredibly strong law. It's a fabulous law in my opinion, but it has a high bar to attain listing status. And, and a species like redfin pickerel is probably not, at least in my lifetime, ever going to maintain or l hit that level of imperilment to, to kick in the Endangered Species Act. However, here in Maine, we have a comparable law on the books called the Maine Endangered Species Act. 
And the law has been around for quite some time, but over the years we have two species of, of native fish that occur in the state of Maine, freshwater fish, that are protected under the Maine Endangered Species Act. Redfin pickerel is one of them, the other one is swamp darter, which occur in York County, way southern Maine. But this law, although not to the level of the U.S. Endangered Species Act, it does give us some incredible, I don't know if power is the correct word, but it gives us chutzpah, so to speak, when we're dealing with uh, developers encroaching on certain uh, critical habitats for listed species. There are designations and uh, a lot of rules to follow. The department publishes a document that you can find here if you have greater curiosity about the Maine Endangered Species Act and how we actually implement this law. But there are some important dif dif ugh, differences between the Maine Endangered Species Act and the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Number one, the Maine Endangered Species Act uh, separates the listing process from the management of the species. The U.S. Endangered Species Act is different. It covers both aspects. Once a species is listed, it kicks in a huge strong arm on how that species, species is to be managed moving forward. Maine is not quite that way. The law also lists specific categories and what their criteria are for designation. And redfin pickerel are, are listed as endangered in the state of Maine. And, we, and through rule, we have set criteria that the department has to look at, address, assess on about an every eight year time frame cycle to keep a species listed add new species to the list if it's warranted, remove a species if it's now secured and recovered and, and could be removed, or potentially extirpated if it's gone for good and there's no hope of recovery. But there are set criteria that hit certain aspects of various population parameters that we have to assess on an every eight year cycle on, under the listing process. Now the redfin pickerel attained these criteria and were recommended for listing as endangered under the Maine Endangered Species Act in 2006. These are just some of the, the information documents that were prepared for the legislature at that time. And through that process they were approved and officially listed as an endangered species in the state of Maine in 2007. So this is the creature that we're talking about. It's a little fish that lives, and at the time, this is a document from 2006 through that legislative <coughs> process, but in two known locations at that time. And, and of course, we're right around Mary Meeting Bay. Now one of the curiosities about this fish is, I don't know if anybody, has anybody ever encountered this book? Yep. Read it? <laughs> I really need to get another copy. <laughs> but, but when I first came to the state of Maine, working as a graduate student up at UMaine, this book was flung on my desk one day, open to this page, and there was a little snippet in a box on a page in this book, and this is what it said. Redfin pickerel, possibly the rarest fish species in Maine. Only three individuals have ever been found. And it did say 1977 in a Merry Meeting Bay tributary. So little is known of this fish that no one is even sure if it is native. Now that was the culmination of information about regarding the status of this species at that time. And this book was published in 1984. And I came to the University of Maine to address and to work on this problem or this issue of what is the status of this weird, strange looking pickerel in Maine because there were three individuals found by a fishery biologist one day and that started my project off. But going back in time a little further, it's actually not as rare as people think. And when I started combing through museum and uh, collection records, the Smithsonian Institution, the Natural History Museum fish collection, probably the largest fish, fish collection 
um, in the United States. They actually house a lot of the voucher specimens that were collected by early fish survey efforts in the state of Maine of the late 1800s and early 1900s. And there were actually five specimens housed in the catalog that were collected in 1893 from three different main locations that were cataloged as Esox americanus. This is the genus and species name for redfin pickerel. They were lacking brook, which is a tributary to Sebago Lake. One of the samples supposedly came from a stream near Pembroke. Who knows where Pembroke is? Where is it? Somewhere up country. Almost to Canada. It's way out in Cobbs Cook Bay area. Way out there. <laughs> and one was just listed as caught in Maine, but they didn't know the absolute location. So I actually requested and got these samples to look at and to study a little more closely. And this is four of those five fish. This is the one fish that was caught in Maine without a specific location and these were the three that came from Lacking Brook and Sebago Lake. I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. Are, are they kept in, in formalin or something? Are they dried? Or are they? they were in formalin. And I, at that time, this was the mid-1990s, the University of Maine up in Orono still maintained a fish collection. Um, that has since changed. The University of Maine has uh, turned over their entire fish collection to, I believe, the University of California, as last I heard. But that's a different story. But when I was combing through the collection one day, I actually found a jar buried in the back of one of the shelves that was listed as Esox Americanus collected from the Pemaquid River in 1972. Two fish in the jar. And, of course, I grabbed it, held on to it, and I had those individuals to look at more closely. And, of course, the three fish that started it all out were collected by fishery biologists with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife in 1977 from an unnamed tributary to Mary Meeting Bay. The only thing they really knew at the time is that they were clearly not chain pickerel. Everybody knows what a chain pickerel looks like. It's a pretty common fish. Those people opened up a book, uh, a fish key, and originally identified them as Esox americanus americanus, the subspecies that is true redfin pickerel. However, they didn't feel confident in their class or in their identification at the time, so they turned those fish over to somebody else in the department who actually did a little further investigation of, of fish identification and came up with an idea of Esox americanus vermiculatus. Now vermiculatus is a subspecies that's a sister to redfin pickerel, but they don't really occur on the Atlantic coast at all. So that raised a red flag of what are these fish, and, and that got me involved to look into it a bit more closely and figure it all out. So a little bit about this group of fishes in general. They're certainly a, a well represented in the fish fauna of Maine. We have many members of this group of fishes that occur here. Not all of them are welcome. Um, but it's one group of fish and the group uh, family Isocidae is actually an ancient group of fishes. This group of fishes has been on the planet since well before the era of dinosaurs. However, with us today, there's only one remaining genus, Esox. All members of this group of fish belong in this, in this single genus. Most people are familiar and know what the pikes are. Northern pike and the muscalonge, they occur here in Maine, but they're non-native and considered invasive pretty much everywhere in the state. The whole different story in their own. That's a northern pike. This is a muscalonge. Popular sport fish, those two are. They grow big. But what we're targeting and talking about today are the pickerels. These are much smaller, but they have the similar classic pike body shape to them. And most people are well aware and, ha and have encountered chain pickerel, Esox niger, which is this beastie right here. Pretty easy to identify a chain pickerel when you encounter them. They have that chain-like patterning down their side. They're actually a very pretty fish. How, how big? 
Uh, chain pickerel can get any over 14, 15 inches is not that uncommon for a big pickerel. They are a fun sport fish to catch and a lot of people do enjoy fishing for them. They're relatively easy to catch too. Um, but we also have this other group called the American pickerel within the group of isosids that are the pickerels and this is the two subspecies Esox americanus vermiculatus which is the grass pickerel and Esox americanus americanus the redfin pickerel. Now looking a little bit about the distributions of these pickerels because sometimes looking at the natural distribution of fishes can help you a lot in identifying what form it is that you have when you're trying to figure out what it is you're looking at. <clears throat> Esox niger, chain pickerel, very common across the whole eastern seaboard of the United States in the lower Mississippi Valley area. And of course we know and are actively managed and sought after by anglers throughout pretty much almost the entire state of Maine. About the only area we don't really have them in abundance is way up in the northern crown, Aroostook County, northern Piscataquis County, those types of areas. However, Esox americanus vermiculatus, the grass pickerel, its native range is the Mississippi River, Ohio River drainages, and lower Missouri River drainages. Be very unusual if the form of fish that we had here in Maine was actually this one, and it really kind of points the picture is of if it is truly a grass pickerel that we have here in Maine, how did it get here? It certainly didn't do it on its own. Um, so that brings up the specter of invasive species, non-native fish issues, and that kind of thing. However, if it's an American or a uh, redfin pickerel, Esox americanus americanus, its natural distribution is the Atlantic seaboard. You get down from about Massachusetts south to Florida through the Alabama, Mississippi area, it's relatively common. Um, in the certain habitat type that these fish tend to occur in. Was not known to occur in Maine uh, previously. It does go up the Hudson River Valley in New York a bit and there are some occurrences actually up in uh, southern Ontario that are considered natural. That would be the logical choice if it's a natural invasion, a natural colonist, a native species to the state would be that it's Esox americanus americanus and just kind of skirted up the coast and headed inland in, a, in main rivers. But how to distinguish and identify these things because there are some dramatic similarities amongst all the three of these forms with some differences in adults, not so pronounced in juveniles, but the difficult thing and often in identifying fishes is we usually don't have the luxury of having all forms that the, the, of what it possibly could be in front of you. You're looking at a single fish and they never look like they do in the photos or on the key and so what is it that you have? So we have to use a, a little bit of investigative theory. And especially if you're looking at juveniles of these three forms, good luck figuring out what it is you have unless you really know what you're doing. These guys all look really similar and they're all really about the same size when they're juveniles that first summer. So what I did for my master's work because I had fish in hand and I actually collected pickerel from all across the coast of Maine um, and I was fortunate enough one day in late August and actually beginning to panic about what I was going to write a thesis on because everything I had encountered was, appeared to be a chain pickerel to me at that point. And then one day I encountered this little stream uh, that was a tributary to Merry Meeting Bay and lo and behold this is what I found. These fish right here were something obviously different than a chain pickerel. So what I did is I had my main sample I got some known redfin pickerel from Maryland, from a fishery biologist from Maryland. I got some known grass pickerel from Missouri. And I had some known chain pickerel from Herman Pond, which is a pond up near the university in, in Bangor area. And I had a whole bunch of pickerel that were collected from the Pemaquid River because we had that occurrence in the Pemaquid. 
at least up and through, through the mid-70s, and then all these pickerel that I caught in a variety of different locations. Now at the time, this was over 20 years ago now, genetics te techniques have advanced significantly, but back then I was doing allozyme electrophoresis. I'm looking at how proteins move through gels, not DNA. This is proteins. But it helps and ve is very helpful when, you're, when your base question is, are these different species? So the thing I want you to take away from this graph is this is some of the actual data I, I figured out and did as part of my masters is this sample that was collected from that unnamed tributary to Mary Meeting Bay. These allele frequencies, these are what these numbers represent, are allele frequencies for six different loci, protein loci. They more closely resemble the known red fin from Maryland than the known grass pickerel from Missouri. And certainly they're very different than the chain pickerel from Herman Pond. And the Pemaquid pickerel that I had caught at the time in the 1990s, every one of them turned out to be a chain pickerel. No evidence of persistence of red fins still occurring there and all the pickerel that I caught from a variety of different locations, every single one of them was a chain pickerel. So at the end of this work, we knew we had red fins from at least that unnamed, unnamed tributary to Mary Meeting Bay, and it was our one known occurrence. But that begs the question, not everybody can run gels when you need to figure out what, what fish you have in hand. And the state of Maine's fishery biologists are certainly not going to do that on a routine basis. And I, being one now, I understand why. Um, but when you know what you're looking at, and one of the other things I did is measure and count a lot of different features on all of these fish to figure out is there a way that you can confidently identify these pickerels without having to go through electrophoresis work or even killing the fish. And what I found is that this little length relationship of the snout relative to the length of the gill operculum does a pretty darn good job of doing it. And it's real quick and easy and dirty in the field. Because so all you need to do is get a measure of the tip of the snout to the eye relative to the distance between the eye and the back of the operculum. The operculum is the gill cover. And it's hard to see in, on this graphic, but these black lines are exactly the same length, the length of the snout, but the gill operculum, the back of the operculum, is actually right here. So this fish's snout is a lot shorter than the length of its operculum. And that's what this relationship shows. And on a chain pickerel, it's even. The distance of the tip of the snout to the eye is the same as the eye to the back of the operculum, or it may even be longer. The other thing that is kind of a good hint that what you have in your hand may in fact be a redfin pickerel is they have kind of a concave shape to their face in general. Because their snout is so snubbed relative to other pikes and pickerels, it, it just has this concave kind of appearance to it. When you look at chain pickerel all day or northern pike, it's actually convex. All right, so where do we have? Now I've continued to look for these guys over the years and have been compiling records because now we have a listed species in the state and it's the responsibility of IFNW to kind of monitor um, the status of that species because we have to review their status every eight years to see if they continue to warrant the designation, etc. So over the years I have continued the hunt and I did find a second uh, population center in, uh, kind of in the Winnegan system of Phippsburg I first detected redfin pickerel in 2003, and then on a second you know, uh, successive visit a few years later, I actually found additional fish and did another part of that same system 
in 2010. So we have expanded that occupied habitat to, to represent that newfound population. So on this map of the coast of Maine, these two blue dots are our known occurrences centered around the Mary Meeting Bay, Phippsburg area. I also have the green dots are unconfirmed reports. Over the years we have had a few kind of credible or could be valid um, uh, occurrences or reports of somebody letting us know that they think they caught a redfin pickerel or um, there's something in that was written in a document that may give a hint that it might have been a redfin pickerel. And I consider these unconfirmed reports. I have been visiting these locations whenever I can to try to document the occurrence. I haven't been successful yet. One of them is Harmon Brook in Saco. Duck Pond in Buxton was actually an interesting one because how this report came in is a birder caught an interesting photo of a, a black crowned night heron eating what looked like a funny looking pickerel and sent the photo to one of our bird biologists to help them identify the bird but oh by the way what kind of fish is this I don't know what it is and they sent the photo to me and I'm like oh my god it looks like a redfin pickerel it was a photo not the best of a fish halfway in the mouth of a, of a heron <laughs> but it did not look like a chain pickerel <laughs> But I have been back multiple times to this pond, and I, I can't say they're not there. I haven't found them. And Brock's Creek in Woolwich uh, is the green dot here. It's on the other side of Mary Meeting Bay across the chops from where the unnamed tributary is. Um, I have been in there. I just have not documented redfin pickerel. And this report comes from a now retired DMR biologist who swore, swore to me up and down that he caught redfin pickerel in there back in the 70s when he was a much younger biologist early in, early in his career. Can't say he's wrong. I just haven't found them yet. We have a questionable occurrence in Acadia National Park is the purple dot here and I call it questionable because I did not see the fish. Um, Acadia National Park contracted with uh, um, some surveyors one summer to complete some inventory work on some previously unsurveyed streams within the park. They keyed them out, identified some funny looking pickerel as red fins. They didn't voucher the samples, they didn't photograph them and I didn't see them. And I just based on the conversation I had with the Acadia National Park biologist who oversaw the project, they were juvenile fish. I really think that they were juvenile chain pickerel, which are very common in Acadia National Park. Um, so not saying there weren't red fins, but I, I don't have a lot of confidence in that report. Keep looking though, I keep looking. And we, I, I hate to say it, but I think we've lost them from the Pemaquid River. I have been back to that system countless times over the years, looking, hunting, scouring. And that sample of East Ox Americanus that I found in the fish collection at Umaine were indeed redfin pickerel caught in the early 1970s. Um, I can't find them anywhere in that system any longer. I think we've lost them. And that's the red dot. So moving forward, we have two known occurrences and maybe a few other. I actually do think we have more out there that we just have not found, uh, haven't documented. These are difficult fish to find even when they're there. Oops. Okay, a little bit about the habitat. It's not a typical stream habitat that you find in Maine where these guys occur and these are photos of one of the systems in the Mary Meeting Bay area where we know they occur. I have pulled fish right out of these two sites. Um, they're small, slow coastal, slow flowing, hardly any current to these streams. Coastal, i.e. coastal, right on the down stream side of, of the stream, it's saline conditions in Mary Meeting Bay. 
and highly vegetated. It's real thick. It's difficult to maneuver in these areas. And there's hardly any co other competing fish species other than American eel and maybe a dace species or two where I have found the red fins right in these spots. They love this stuff, apparently. All right. So that's the habitat we're looking for. Basic ecology, there's nothing terribly remarkable about these guys. They're not a whole lot different than any other pickerel or pike species out there. They eat whatever they catch and fits in their mouth. They're not picky eaters, but because they're small in size, uh, it's insects, isopods, they love isopods, and juvenile or small fish if they can get them. They are like any other pike and pickerel. They spawn in early spring. If there's ice still around, it doesn't phase them. They'll still spawn anyway. They spawn in the weedy, shallow, kind of margin areas of the habitats. They're broadcast spawners, meaning they just spew their gametes and swim away. The eggs are semi-adhesive and adhere to the vegetation, so they're not actually falling down into the sediments. They're up in that vegetation for incubation. No parental care. The parents are gone after spawning. One of the interesting things about all of the pikes and pickerels, they do readily hybridize with chain pickerel if they co-occur. And in the Winnegan system, we do have chain pickerel in the impoundment, but where I have found red fins are in the tributaries to that impoundment. Age and growth, they are a little bit different in this area relative to our other uh, pikes and pickerels. They don't live long. They're a, kind of a faster growing, burnout young kind of species. Most are two or three years old. When I have aged a few fish, I had one individual that was a four year old. And that's the oldest one I've seen in Maine. They're generally four to five inches in length, maximum. Most of the time when you encounter them, it's more like two or three inches though. They're small, very small fish. Can you age them while they're alive? No. Right, so you have to go to Oliths or something? Oliths are, I was, you want a short, uh, short duration young fish, you can use scales. These scales are just super tiny and uh, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it can be done. I use scales on these guys. The Oliths are super tiny too. You, they do have them though. Um, so how are we managing these guys? Because there are listed species in the state, and I wouldn't say we do a lot of hands-on management. We certainly don't. But where we know they occur, we keep an eye on them. One of the populations is privately owned. There's a private landowner that owns both sides of the stream where, in that section of the stream where the red fins are known to occur. Um, He's not the easiest landowner to work with. <laughs> and to be honest, I haven't been back into that site for like 10 years because he won't let me on his land. He sees me pull up in the state truck. If he sees me pull up in the state truck, uh, it, it usually ends up not being a good day. Um, the other location, though, Winnegans, uh, is not as developed. The uh, development encroachment is not as problematic. And in the upper reaches, the tributaries, where the red fins actually are, is a lot of conservation land already. It's difficult to get in there, though. Um, it's not the, it's a bit, of, I, have, I have to launch a canoe by the road and then paddle all the way up. It takes most of the day just to get to where I need to go. Yeah. With regard to the, the recalcitrant landowner, what's his objection? Is it just state in general? Or yeah. Do you think you're government. Down his farming operation or something? I think, yeah, that's probably part of it, although that's never been an objective. No, it's when I first found the red fins in there, uh, he is a farmer. He has cat, he had cattle at the time. Um, his cat, he was using the stream as a water source for his cattle. Uh, I just wanted to talk to him about, number one, accessing the stream, getting his permission to cross his land to get into the stream, but two, 
you know, it, it might be a bit, might be a good idea if we can find a different water source and I can help you with that for your cattle. And uh, he, 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 he has, uh, he, he was not very uh, easy to work with, at least for somebody from the government. As I recall, he does have another pond now, actually. Yeah. So maybe that's, maybe things will change. Well, I did talk to DEP and the NRCS at various times, and I know that at least DEP paid him a couple visits about possibilities of doing things things a little different. And I he had, I did notice at one point in time he did get a second or a different water source for his cattle, and he had since converted to bison actually. Um, and he did fence off the stream so the bison could not get into the stream at that time. But there was a lot more forest that was cleared <laughs> and converted to pasture for the bison. Um, I continue to monitor the populations that I can get to um, and just uh, assure and, and hope to assure that fish are still there. Now the one thing about red fins is they just naturally occur at a low abundance. These are not schooling fish. They're not fish that play well with others. Even though they're tiny, they're fierce. They're, they're vicious predators. Um, they're difficult to, to encounter because they are spread out, patchily distributed. They don't play well with others. Um, you have to have a strong search image in your mind of what it is you're looking for. They're easy to miss, even by a trained eye. They're, they camouflage right in with that dark stained water and heavy vegetation. Um, the easiest way, I'm usually electrofishing, and if they're there, you're going to get them that way. You can angle them up if you're using small tackle, soft hands. You can angle them, but there, there is a trick to it. I have not been successful, by the way, in angling a, a redfin pickerel. Um, they're just difficult to find. So even though I know that they're still there, especially in the Winnegan system, often I go, I can only spend a day at a time on a project like this. And more often than not, it's a negative day versus one where I might find a single fish. Um, one of that expansion for the Winnegans population that occurred in 2010 was a happenstance catch on a routine stream electrofishing survey of a stream that is part of that system, um, but it's not intuitive. You have to kind of follow how the water goes on maps. It was after I caught the redfin that I'm like, oh my god, it is actually a connection with the Winnegan system. Um, but it was a routine electrofishing survey of a previously unsurveyed stream and we were just there just doing routine inventory and cataloging work and lo and behold we shocked up a redfin pickerel. Pretty, pretty exciting day. And that is actually this fish right here. Um, one of the things that is a, uh, a, a, a constant threat with these guys is the possibility of invasives, non-native fish species getting into some of these habitats. Um, and I will say this, we have had reports of northern pike in Winnegan's impoundment. Um, and I think they are there. I think it's a confirmed water body. I have not caught one there, but there's strong indications that they're there. I don't know if that's going to affect our redfin pickerel or not. Time will tell. There's always the possibility of emerging threats that disease, uh, temperature issues, we're getting into climate change issues. Now one of the things that about this species and its occurrence in Maine is that it's at the northern extent of its natural range. Normally I would not be so concerned about climate change with a species that's a warm water species that's at the northern extent of its range except that where we have them they have a limited ability to move anywhere else as conditions change or local land changes around them. So I monitor. We do continue to survey and search for new or previously undocumented populations whenever I hear of reports or possibilities and whenever I have time and I'm in the neighborhood I might hunt around 
in this area to try a new site or go back to some of the sites that I haven't been successful in finding them before. I'm always interested in hearing new potential reports. If you, anybody ever thinks they might encounter a redfin, let me know. <laughs> And eDNA, we have actually delved into the possibility of de de developing an environmental DNA detection technique to help us monitor this species a little more effectively because they are cryptic and hard to find. However, when we initially tried to develop this technique to include red fins, um, the uh, person I was working with up at UMaine on developing the tools for us to do this quickly came to the realization that because of the level of, uh, of evolutionary connections between chain pickerel and redfin pickerel, they're not divergent enough to use standard eDNA monitoring techniques that are available today. So we would have to just, it, it, it will take and require a much length, more lengthy, difficult, expensive process to develop a tool to be functional for us here in Maine. So. That one's on the back burner for now. So, how can you help? Um, help us keep track of this interesting little fish. Go pickerel fishing. Just use small tackle, real small. <laughs> where you think, number one, target places where you think the habitat might be right. And that's what I showed you in one of those previous slides of that s real slow flowing, dark colored, really heavy, heavily vegetated um, streams, really coastal streams, tiny little coastal streams. Um, but of course it is a state listed endangered species. We're not saying don't go fishing, but if you think you have a redfin, it's catch and release and, be, and handle with extreme care. We just want the fish to go back alive in the water. But photograph, photograph, photograph. I love photographs of fish. Please send them to me, especially if you think you've got a red fin pickerel. Another way to potentially uh, get a clue that you might be having a red fin pickerel occurrence in the location you're looking at is to look for the juveniles. Because even the juvenile pickerel, red fin pickerel, have that snub snout compared to other pickerel species. And it's once you know what you're looking at and you've seen it, it's not that difficult to see, and, and you can even see it on the little juveniles. The best time of the year to look for juveniles is late summer, like August, maybe early September. And these guys don't move if they're there, and it's a wonderful thing to do if you're out kayaking for a peaceful kayak one day, because you can get into these shallow vegetated areas be quiet and just slowly paddle in and those pickerel, if they're, they're right on the surface and they don't move and uh, if the lighting is right, use polarized lenses, you can actually just see them sitting on the surface of the water. They're cute little guys and a lot of times you can just dip them, dip them with a dip net. So I'm always interested in hearing if you think you have spotted a red fin, that's how you can get a hold of me, email or phone. I love photos, and these are all redfin pickerel. Any questions? <laughs> Is there any evidence that they'll like brook trout and they will go to salt under some situations, and that's how they progress along the coast? The asasids in general have a poor tolerance for salinity. However, Chain pickerel and redfin pickerel have the greatest tolerance for salt. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can spend any lengthy time in there. It's more of like quick shots to get through it. Um, there's, uh, I have not encountered in the literature or in my travels or talking with anybody else who has familiarity with this species any evidence that they can spend any lengthy amount of time in saline conditions. However, I think those streams that abut a, an estuary or saline conditions are important for maintaining the ecological integrity of these habitats that they occur in because that limits the possibility of other species being able to migrate in to these areas. And I think that's important for our pickerel here. In, in the bay, if, 
those spots that you found, them, those are all below the chops, between the floor and head of the chops. So there's a definite difference in salinity there between above the chops. Yes. So I don't know if yes. That's the case with the other locations or not. Um, the one again site is further south or down downstream in the bay, and it's definitely um, on the other side of the road. You can just tell it's salt marsh. Um, so, so I don't remember the other sites. There are some down south, but are they always? There's always some salinity. Some of those, some of the other sites are actually kind of surprisingly far inland. Okay. So you know, and, and you go further south in the distribution of the species, and it's more common to find them further inland and, you know, and, and straying much further away from, from the ocean. So given the sluggish habitat, there's no reason they couldn't be further upstream. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, do you think that, uh, I mean, at one level you're sort of, I think, presenting it as these are moving north, into these areas, but it could it could it also be time-wise that it's a reduction of their their range? Yes, we are definitely at the northern extent of their natural range. Just looking at what we know about the distribution of the species across the continent and where we fit into that big picture, you know, we're kind of the the top of that. Um, however, it would not surprise me in the least if in the past. Uh, in past Maine's history, we had more populations than we currently have. And I know that we had them in the Pemaquid River at one point, which is further north up the coast than where Mary Meeting Bay is. Um, so we know for a fact that they were up there, and we have since lost them and retracted down to Mary, is Mary Meeting. Is where the stocking of sport fisheries for bass and things like that may have uh, you know, the interesting thing about where these fish occur in the habitats that they occur in, even in other states further south in the distribution, they don't compete well with other fish in general. So where they persist and occur are these small streams that there really aren't other competing larger bodied fish, which are usually the targets of sport fisheries. Um, and, and it's, it, it's just, I think it's just the basic kind of ecology of this species. They, they prefer to be alone. They prefer, they do better without a lot of neighbors and competitors. And that's where we find them in, in wherever they occur. They're in these kind of weird cryptic habitats that other fishes don't occur in either or any way. When you see these sites where these fish are, you know, I, I've surveyed and walked and, and uh, cataloged streams all over the state. These habitats are different. They, I don't find them anywhere else. And, and the streams just look different. Uh, I, I can't put a finger on exactly what it is, but it just it looks different. The streams are small. The water looks different. We see stained waters in other locations of the state. That's not necessarily un that uncommon. But in these areas, you got kind of like a, a, it's like a perfect storm of multiple factors. They're tiny little streams. These streams are only about five feet wide. One of them, it's actually the remains of an old dug canal. So it's surprisingly deep because it was a dug canal. Um, it's clay, it's treacherous to try to maneuver and, and work in that area. You will fall, I've done it. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the extremely vegetated, no discernible flow or current, but yet it's a stream. <laughs> Interesting little fish. Yeah, well thank you. Thank you. <laughs>